thank you for being with us again. Uh, we're considering the uh, quality of our Father God that's uh, known as Providence. And we begin this series by looking at the question, what is our Father God doing? And to answer this question, we need to understand the biblical concept of providence. And this word is grounded in the scriptures. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of uh, biblical reference to this word in both the Hebrew and the Greek languages, uh, original languages of the Bible. And we uh, suggested that you can find the you can find the summary of this quality that he has in Romans three. 336, uh, in this brief, powerful statement that the Apostle Paul makes by the Spirit. And the first phrase is, For from him, our Father God is the source of all things. Nothing exists except in relation to him. Understand this? He is the source of all things. Nothing exists except in relation to him. And then the next little phrase in that sentence is, For from him and through him, he is the guide of all things. Nothing happens apart from his purposeful activity. He has a design, he has a purpose, but he is guiding things in that purpose. So he's the source. Nothing exists except in relation to him. And also then he is the guide. Nothing happens, listen carefully, nothing happens apart from our Father God's purposeful activity. And then the last part of the phrase, uh, in him, and in him, or, you know, really to him, I'm sorry, from him, through him and to him. He is the goal of all things. Our Father God has a purpose in all that he does in the world. And he providentially governs and directs all things in order that they may accomplish his purpose. And those three brief statements summarize this powerful characteristic of our Father God uh, known as providence. And then next, you remember we talked about that the... Uh, essential trait of our Father God, this providence uh, trait that he has, was in relation to himself as revealed in his son. And it culminated in his historical death and subsequent resurrection from the dead and then ascension to his original place. We uh, looked at Acts chapter 4, if you remember that. It was the reaction that the early believers had to the freedom of Peter and John from imprisonment. And they came back and they gave enormous praise and recognition to the Creator God. And then they orchestrated this powerful praise by saying it was the predetermined, preordained plan for our Father God to accomplish this work in His Son. And so you, so now the next thing we did was uh, was look at the relation. That was that was the idea of our Father's God in the death of Jesus of Nazareth demonstrating the greatest expression of, of his love, but at the same time, uh, de uh, was demonstrating his greatest wrath, the greatest wrath he had for uh, sin and for the sinful heart and the sinful rebellion uh, of humanity, uh, past, present, and future. So we have both the perfect, you might say the perfect revelation of the Father, Father's love for all humanity. At the same time, he has the perfect revelation of our Father's wrath for all those disobedient to Him. Now what I want us to do is look at this real, I'm going to use the word thorny, this thorny issue of our Father's God, providence, and evil. But before we look at the contemporary evidence of evil, which is abounds, and how our Father's involved in 21st century evil, I'd like for us to trace the origin of evil that's given in biblical history. And so I'm going to of course, used uh, biblical history as the as, as the guide for us. To, if you you come up with your own definition of evil and your own uh, ideas about where evil originated, and uh, but I believe the Bible to be the most historical, reliable source for uh, all understanding of all things, and uh, particularly this uh, origin of evil. So, if you have your Bibles, you're going to be very familiar with this, and if you we don't have a Bible, listen very carefully. You get a copy and you read it for yourself. So we're going to start in the very beginning. And some of this is going to be probably redundant to you maybe, but please don't let it be that way. Now let's look at it new and afresh and may the spirit of Christ and the mind of Christ to reveal things to us possibly that we haven't seen before. And when we get to chapter 3, 
Genesis chapter 3, as you know, we've already seen the uh, record of, of the creation of all things in chapters 1 and 2. Nothing existed except it comes from him. And everything, everything we know, everything we don't know, small, large, seen, unseen, it doesn't really matter. All things originate in him as creator. Now, when you get to chapter 3, there's another uh, de there's another uh, being revealed. And if you look at the very first sentence there, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field. Now, who is this? We don't know a lot right now at the very beginning. Don't know a lot about the identity of this being, but it's identified as a serpent. And the characteristic of this being as a serpent is craftiness, deceitfulness. And as we unfold the pages of the Bible, we see more and more and we get a clearer picture of this diabolical being and his function in a human history. He has a function, he has a purpose, and we will see that as, as we go through the go through the history of, of the origin and the history of evil. And you know the story. And if you don't know the story, please look at it, because there's a conversation that goes on with the woman and eventually the man's involved. Then they decided that they're going to do something that's against the command that's given by the Creator, and then they're going to have this enlightenment, you might say. They're going to gain this knowledge of good and evil, so they have this awareness, you might say, or this consciousness of what is good and what is evil, the contrast between the two. And so we now have then the, um, the emergence of this, you might say, cross-pollination. I don't know if it's not a good word, but we now we have this evil jumping from the, the ser serpent image being actually there in the garden, in the garden there somehow, and then um, going to the to the humans. So the humans now have this knowledge of good and evil. Before I go any further, I just want to say one thing uh, about the origin of evil. Uh, here's a quote from Wayne Grudem. If evil came into the world in spite of the fact that God did not intend it, and did not want it to be there? Then he raises two questions. Then what guarantee do we have that there will not be more and more evil that he does not intend, and that he does not want to be here? The other question is, what guarantee do we have that he will be able to use it for his purpose, or even that he can triumph over it? End of quote. Think about that. This change in the status of the first humans has created a situation that's described in verse 14, where the Creator God, the Lord God, is going to say to the serpent, then, Because you have done this, curses is you more than all cattle and all the beasts of the field. On your belly you're going to go. Uh, to dust you will eat the dust of it. And then look at 15. You've read this before, you've heard of this before, possibly. I'm going to put an enmity, a division, or hostility between you and the woman, between your seed and, and her seed. He will bruise you on the head, and you will bruise him on the heel. So we now have this uh, this revelation, this unfolding, not only of the origin of evil, now we have the presence of evil on the earth. Now it is connected to or once embodied by this uh, this serpent now, but now it changes into some other form, or the, 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 the creator changes this being into some other form we may be familiar with. But now this, there's this hostility and this division. There's going to be then, uh, verse 15, there's going to be a continuous conflict. There's going to be a continuous conflict between the humans, the offspring, the seed of the Say, uh, of, the, of the serpent's influence, now we know as Satan or the dragon of old and other names in the scriptures. And it's going to be against the righteous seed of the woman. So you have both this animosity, hostility throughout history between these two offsprings of these two uh, originators. One's going to be the serpent, the Satan, uh, the, the uh, dragon of old, all that. And then it's going to be the woman. Now, we think that if they're at odds, we're going to possibly think then that the woman's seed is going to be the 
the seed that the creator is going to preserve and then somehow using the offspring of the serpent to accomplish his purpose. Uh, thousands of years later, uh, in the biblical canon, one of the writers is going to describe this influence, a, this satanic influence is taking actually three forms or is expressed in three ways. It's going to be expressed in the world that's going to be evolving and it's going to be coming about through humans as they live out their lives on the earth. There's going to be this world, this um, adornment, you might say, this all the creation, all, all the things that humans are going to invent through their imagination and creativity and all that. There's going to be this world system, worldly system. It's going to be economics and all that kind of thing, education and all that. And then it's going to be the humans themselves. It's going to be their own idea, their own thinking, their own mentality. He called it the flesh, fleshly mindedness, you might say. And then he mentions Satan. He uses the word, he uses the phrase, the prince of the power of the air. So now this <clears throat> hostility from the origina origination of this evil factor in humanity is going to be expressed in, in these three different forms, or three different forms of expression. Now we know the mind of the creator. We got to get it. We get into a little bit of what he's thinking and what he's planning. He will preserve the offspring of the earth, on the earth. He will preserve an offspring from the woman on the earth that is going to reveal his true identity. Understand this. He's going to preserve and keep that offspring from her, from the woman, throughout human history. At the same time, he will reveal the full extent of evil doesn't sound good he's going to reveal the full extent of evil which will actually eliminate his character in the humans in which he is going to preserve his nature and the quality of his life and his true identity in those humans that submit to his authority by his word and his spirit let's look at the characteristics or not the characteristics, let's look at the consequences of this change that's going to come about in the relationship between the humans and between their creator in the same chapter is going to be pain and childbirth. The ground that the man is going to work to try to produce some sort of sustenance for his existence is not going to be cooperative with him. The ground is going to present all kind of obstacles to the, to the fruit, to the everything he's going to try to get to sustain him. And then you're going to find in the next generation uh, just a horrible expression of this hostility that's going to reside actually expressed in the humans. It's going to be, it's going to be the death. It's going to be murder. It's going to be murder in the second generation in which there's going to be sibling rivalry. And then one, uh, one, one of the offspring is going to murder the other. And then it, as time passed, we're going to see the genealogy of these first two humans. We're going to get to Genesis six through nine. And we're going to see a very difficult situation here arise. If you want to turn to Genesis 6, you're familiar with this. <clears throat> you look at Genesis 6, the Creator, the Lord God, in verse 5, sees the wickedness of man great on the earth, and every intent of the thoughts <clears throat> of his heart, of the human heart, were continually evil. So he was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. In verse 7, here's what he said. It's revealed that he will blot out the men, the humans that he has chosen from the earth, from the animals to, from humans to animals, creeping things, birds of the sky. <clears throat> and I'm sorry that I made them all. So, however, he's going to preserve a remnant. And that remnant is in this one man in verse, in verse eight. And it's going to be his offspring, three sons, their wives, and, and of course, this man's wife. And so from six, seven, eight, and nine, you're going to see this horrific horrible destruction of all mankind except these few humans and a few animals. Now people are going to say, my goodness, that, that is a that is a that God has failed. That God is not just in his wrathfulness against humans. But if you'll trace it back to the original human, 
And if you'll see that in the Bible, it's going to talk about all humans coming after that human, then all humans are very much like that first human. And therefore, all humans have the same character that, that those first humans do. And therefore, they have the same independence and arrogance, and they have the same hostility toward the Creator and disobedience that the first humans do. So that's all that's being produced except a few. A few in the form of this man, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And that's what we're left with at the end of chapter 9. We got the League of Nations, uh, the more humans are coming from these three, but there is a particular line of one of these three that's the center of a, a focus for uh, biblical history. And when you get to the end of chapter 11, in the beginning of chapter, uh, chapter 12, you find that there is another man, one man. One man in chapter 6, one man in chapter 7, one man in chapter 12. And this man is going to be the one that is going to be given a promise. And you're familiar with this in Genesis chapter 11. Keep in mind, we're talking about, we're talking about the origin of evil, where it came from, how it's expressed in human history, how it's continually operating, and how the providential, powerful, wrathful, loving God is reacting to this, this evil, and how he's at the same time preserving the, what he's going to do. But he's going to be very specific to this one human in Genesis 12. And this one human, he's going to make three promises to this one human. I'm going to give you this land and I'm going to make you a great nation, and all the uh, nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you. And so you're going to have the, the rest of biblical history is going to be the unfolding of how this is accomplished in spite of the intensity and, and in spite of the opposition, in spite of the hostility of the evil that is coming uh, through other humans that are against the Creator God. Now, before we leave, um, before we leave the uh, the Genesis account, there's there's one incident, one person, and it's over in chapter 36. We're not going to go through the history of this one individual, but a good portion of this document. There's 50 chapters in this document, and so a good good part of this book is about this one person that comes out of this out of this family from the man in chapter 12, and this is the life of Joseph. He's a picture. He's a picture as well as others, but his is a very vivid picture of this massive struggle in a person's life to accomplish the Creator God's purpose against all evil that could come upon an individual. Now, a lot of a lot of people suffer, no doubt about, in the inner time. This man experienced rejection in his family. Now he's not. He's not by any means perfect himself. He's done, he's done some things. He experienced rejection in his family. He experienced slavery. He experienced false accusations and imprisonment. And in spite of all those things, at the reunion of his brothers, after he becomes a very important person in the most powerful nation on the earth, the reunion of the family occurs. You're familiar with this. And in the very last chapter of this, of this Genesis document, he tells them in chapter 50, if you want to look over that, make it, mark it in your Bibles, very important statement he makes. Very, very keen insight revealed to him by the Spirit of our God to understand something like this. This is very critical. He says, as for you, that's his brothers, you meant evil against me. Is that true? Yes, they did. Look at the story. You read the story, read it again. And everything they did, everything they thought, everything they schemed to do was evil. But God, he says, meant it for good in order that to bring about this present result to preserve this people. And that's about 70, whatever the number is, right? But not very many to preserve this people that they may live. And so in that a powerful statement, you've got evil going like this. Up above that, in another dimension of time and space and matter, you've got this providential God that is ordering all things to accomplish his will way down here. Now, did this, did this man know all this? No. This man was not 
privy to everything that was going on in his life. But when you look at his reaction to the circumstances he found himself in, you got to say, wow, my goodness, this is a very unusual person that begins to react the way he did when evil was all against him. But when he finally saw the result of everything, he looked back at all the events of his life and he wondered, you guys meant to destroy me. But there was the Lord God Almighty, the one true Father God. He is the one who preserved me for the good and the preservation of this family. There's a, uh, there's a Bible that, that one of my grandchildren has. In fact, just got it. And it's just that there's, it's the illustrated Bible. It's for its artic- artistic expression. And uh, this is kind of the, it's kind of a picture that looks at. It just so happens that whoever put this together, they chose this verse and they chose to illustrate it with this uh, beautiful artistic uh, drawing. Very, very interesting how, how that's done. And, um, you know, this particular Bible, the, the owner of the Bible, one of my grandchildren, they can, they can actually express their own artistic design and imagination of the scriptures. Very interesting. Uh, now, let's hasten along. The rest of biblical history is the preservation of the promises that were made to this one man back in Genesis 12. His name was Abraham. And all of that was now we know, because we live in, we live in another age now, and we've got the record. It was all these promises were made to this man until the coming of God the Son, the God-man, Jesus of Nazareth, who completed all those promises made thousands of years earlier. Do you see how you can, you, you can understand this from him, through him, to him, are all things? Can you understand with, the, with our human minds, can we grapple this that before things were even in, came into existence? that the creator of all things, now we know as Father God, God the Son, God the Spirit, orchestrated the revelation, the unfolding, progressive revelation, if you want to use that term, of his true identity through this man, the God-man, Jesus of Nazareth. Before we leave the Old Testament, there's... A couple other things I want to say. About the same time that this man Abraham lived, back in the Genesis period, uh, a lot of people believe there was another man that possibly lived about that same time. He becomes another example, just like Joseph did, just just like Joseph in the Genesis account. Uh, And you could pick others too. And just selecting these two. And there's another one you're very familiar with also. And his name is Job. He becomes the image. He becomes, you know, he might be, I don't know yet, you hate to, you get in trouble, I guess, when you select Old Testament individuals. And um, anyway, anyway, I'm just suggesting he's, he, he may be the, one of the premier examples in his, you know, his life of this massive struggle between the preservation of good against the powerful influences of evil. This came against him. This evil came against him in the form of the destruction of his family members. His wife was excluded. All of his children and every, all of those were destroyed. They were taken. They were, they were killed. Uh, all of his possessions, all of his properties. He was a very wealthy man at that time. He's, and he considered, you read his story, he's a very righteous man. Everything was gone. Everything was taken. And I'll tell you, if you look back, it was natural disasters. We're going to be talking about that in future. Natural disaster, you want to call that, that took out all of his possessions 
and all of his properties. Not only that, then comes his personal health. His personal health was taken with the exception of his life. That was the only thing he had left was air to breathe. And he probably struggled with every breath based on the disease that some people believe he had at that time. At the end of this arduous life of disappointments and, and facing death and he himself wanting to die in various ways and even regrets the day that he had even been born. He was confronted with or by the Creator God, made a personal appearance to him in some form, some way. And I want to read what Douglas Axe uh, writes in, in, in a book that I've got. He explains, Dr. Axe, Professor Axe, explains the providence of our Father God in creation which confirms his superintendence over all things through time, space, matter, and energy, even through the horrific losses of Job, which were considered evil. Here's what Professor Axe said. The book of Job, for example, tells us how Job was reminded of his smallness when asked about his creator. Quote, Here's what the questions came from the Creator to Job. Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars and spreads his wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? Job 39, 27. That's the end of quote from Job. Then he says, those questions have the same humbling impact on us today. Thousands of years later, anyone who thinks otherwise, anyone who thinks they have a solid grasp of life should try designing and making something remotely remarkable as the hawk or the eagle. Flying toys with flapping wings don't even come close. Those things are made on assembly lines, part by part, only to fall apart with repeated use. End of quote. The gargantuan task for the Creator God to preserve the promises to this one man unfolds in the family of this one man chapter 12 of Genesis, throughout recorded history, in the face of near extinction, extermination, to conquer a land for protection and provisions in order that they survive. After being established as a nation with their laws, this people called Israel struggled to overcome tribes and other nations who although given the evidence of a creator God, these other tribes and nations were given the same evidence that the people of Israel were, they rejected him. They rejected the creator to worship him, not as creator, but they worship a plethora of other gods in the form of idols, which they brought about from their own image and their own minds. Instead of worshiping the one true creator God, Humans would worship what they themselves had created. We talked about that last time, Romans 1. So this chosen people had to war against these other groups to avoid extinction, as well as follow. Some of you are upset because of these wars that go on in the Old Testament. And it was for survival, and it was, it was permitted, and even it was directed by this creator God. I don't know if that upsets some of you, but you need to read the story a little bit more carefully. So not only did they have to war against these other groups to, to, to not be exterminated, but also they had to follow these laws that were given to them as a community to guard against diseases, to guard against famine, and even 
fighting among themselves. If they did not have these laws and commandments and precepts to guide them, they would, they would have killed each other. They would have robbed from each other. They still did that to a certain extent. So Israel was not always, though, fully following the Lord God. In order to keep them under his command and under his guidance. So this is the offspring of the seed of the woman we're talking about now. In order to keep them under his command or his governance, he would send evil nations to conquer them and even enslave them. However, there would always be a remnant of these faithful chosen people who would be preserved. So throughout the history of, the, of his people, the Lord God will use evil. Now, I want to just use that for he would use evil. We're talking about the seed of the serpent, the seed of Satan, the seed of the deceiver. He would use evil. And I'm going to use some other words. Do what you think. He would direct the evil. He would guide the evil, but he would not cause it. Make a difference on this. Our Father God is not the cause of evil. He guides it, he directs it, and he uses it to preserve the purity and the unity of his people. Get this. Please understand this. This is what I think the Bible teaches. He uses evil to preserve the purity and the unity of his people. The most powerful nations in human history, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Romans, all of those were under his authority, his authority and under his rule to accomplish his purpose of preserving the promises that he had made to this one man in Genesis 12 throughout history past and present. When we come to the end of this section of the Bible in the Old Testament, Israel is unified and is returned to the land that was originally promised to them by this one man, or to this one man. And the worship of the one true creator God was begun again in the construction of their temple and the reconstruction of the city. Hundreds of years prior to that, let me just go back just a little bit, hundreds of years prior to that, and in, 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 uh, just before all this happened, there were those men who were called prophets. They were spokespersons for the Lord God. And there's a section that I just want to point to your attention, and you can look at this and please read it for yourself. It's in Isaiah 40 through 55, 56, and right in there. It reveals the coming of, of a person who would be the final deliverer and unifier and preserver of the people of the Lord God. In addition to this supernatural work, this person will bring all nations, Jew and Gentile, into his kingdom. With him is the king. This kingdom will have no end, that is, it will be eternal. It will have no geographical, political, social, economic, or ethnic boundaries. In other words, as one writer has said later on in the canon of, of all the Bible, including the New Testament, this people will be a, quote, chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that they may proclaim the excellencies of him who called them out of darkness into this marvelous, powerful, life-changing light, illumination, wisdom, knowledge that, that will be given to them. 400 years later, 400 years later, between the old documents and the new documents, the person described by this prophet and others will appear as Jesus of Nazareth. As recorded in the four Gospels of the New Testament, the Lord God of the Old Testament, now to be known as the Father God of Jesus, the Son of God, the God-man, has together preordained the life of this most perfect human who has ever been born of woman and ultimately brings about his horrific death as no human has ever experienced, only to bring back from the dead into a three in, in three short years and later to return to where he came from. So as we previously as we previously have, have dealt with, the Father God of Jesus of Nazareth accomplished this by providentially using evil nations and people groups as he's done 
in all the nation's past. Do you remember in Acts chapter 4? Read that again. He used evil nation, evil groups against him in order to accomplish his purpose. So he brings about the preservation and the unification of a people on the earth that will expand and enlarge throughout human history until his son returns to bring the consummation of his rule universally. So, I hope that helps. The origin of evil, where it came from, then how evil is going to be manifested through the spirit of this uh, person who's going to be, uh, this deity is going to be against everything that the creator God does, including humans and including everything humans do, everything humans make, it's not to his glory and honor. But then there's going to be the seed. There's going to be the, the offspring of the woman that's going to be revealed throughout human history, particularly and especially in the, in the promises made to this one man. Now, there's another Bible that uh, one of my grandchildren had, have, and this is called the Journaling Bible. And in the preface or the beginning of the introduction to this Bible, I just want to just read this to you. They, they make this quote. Moses said to the people of Israel that the word of God, quote, is no empty word for you, but your very life. Deuteronomy 34, 47. I'm going to say that one more time. He said the word of God is no empty word for you, but your word for life. I want to ask you, me too, and you ask other friends and family members, is the word of God your deepest source of nourishment for your soul and body? Is, is this the source, is this the relationship that nourishes you, and is this the relationship that you feed upon and that you find vitality and strength and courage and stamina? And in all the things that you are looking for, rest, is this, is this relationship with the person who wrote this, is this relationship through this word the source for your, for your sustenance of your life? Your very life depends upon this relationship through this word. We thank you, Father, for this time together. We ask that the uh, study of these blessed, uh, precious words will be powerful to our souls and, and to our bodies uh, during these very challenging, difficult days. We ask that you would use uh, the scriptures that we have referred to and the truth of these things. Please correct. May the meditation of my heart and the hearts of those who hear be acceptable in, in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer in your son's name. Amen. Look forward to seeing you again real soon.